Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Jolly. I'm a professor at Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles, and I also serve as a fellow for the Civil Justice Research Initiative of UC Berkeley School of Law. While everybody is getting settled, I wanted to let you all know about some programs currently being offered here at UC Berkeley, specifically the following opportunities to advance your career. We have Sustainable Capitalism and ESG Online, which will be returning in March of 2022. We have ESG navigating the board's role, which returns on April of 2022, and leadership in the legal profession, which returns April of 2022. You can learn more about these and other Berkeley Law Executive Education programs and the courses offered on their website, executive.law.berkeley.edu. But right now, I am thrilled to welcome you to this 15th episode in this series of Berkeley Boost webinars sponsored by the Civil Justice Research Initiative. The CJRI is an academic initiative that explores through interdisciplinary university-based research how the civil justice system can be made more available to everyone seeking relief. And while this is our 15th episode overall, those of you who have attended before will see that this is our first under the new moniker, Conversations in Civil Justice. But despite the name change, the goal remains the same. We aim to explore the impact of important issues currently facing civil justice. And with each episode, we aim to offer perspectives from legal practitioners, scholars, and jurists. And as always, we invite audience participation. So please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom, and we will address them throughout our conversation. Today's episode will focus on bankruptcy and mass torts. And for this important and very timely topic, we are thrilled to have with us today, Ellen Noble and Professor Sergio Campos. Ellen is the Bud Attorney of Public Justice, where she litigates high impact public interest appeals. Her practice covers a wide range of issues, including access to justice, civil rights, consumer protection, workers' rights, constitutional law, and court secrecy. Sergio is the professor of law at University of Miami School of Law. Prior to joining that faculty, he was the Charles Hamilton Houston Fellow at Harvard Law School and was in private practice. His research interests include civil procedure, federal courts, and remedies. Ellen and Sergio, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Richard, thanks uh, for having us. Ellen, maybe you could kick us off a little bit by telling us why are we having this conversation? What, what is important about uh, bankruptcy and, and mass torts? Yeah, well, so mass torts, they can arise from all sorts of uh, different things. You can have a corporation's contamination of the water that leads to a flood of litigation. You could have a defective product, a really dangerous drug, or even an institution that was enabling widespread sexual abuse. And these cases are really complex and raise some unique challenges because you have some aggregation of the process in an MDL or multi-district litigation where you might have one judge making pretrial rulings and discovery determinations and maybe even some bellwether trials. But you still have a bunch of individual cases with some individualized questions of liability or damages and global settlements here can be really hard. The problem is that the corporations have responded to this challenge by turning to bankruptcy as a means of resolving their mass tort liability, or at least some call it a problem, including myself. Um, and the concern here is that they're exploiting statutory gaps in the bankruptcy code and corporate law to evade liability, denying tort victims access to the courts and ultimately the compensation that they're owed. Uh, so the concern is that bankruptcy, which is meant to find a fair and equitable distribution um, when you've got you know, a limited amount of money left and you want to uh, settle all of these different claims and you owe people more money than you have, instead bankruptcy ends up being used as a tool to minimize liability um, and evade the court system. And we're seeing this a lot right now. There's, there's a, a very high profile examples of this type of use of the bankruptcy system. That's right. I mean, I think real quick, the three sort of headline cases that have come out recently, you've got USA Gymnastics, they filed for bankruptcy in 2008 in response to the fallout of Larry Nassar's uh, sexual abuse of athletes. That ended up being a $400 million settlement that was reached 
Uh, but in exchange for the money, the survivors had to agree that they wouldn't bring any claims against these other entities like the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, um, the Bella and Martha Caroli who are running the gymnastics uh, group. Um, and they couldn't bring any claims against them even though those entities had not declared bankruptcy. Um, and many of the survivors believe that those entities like the committee knew about or should have known about the abuse. So it involved the release of claims against these entities that hadn't declared bankruptcy. We saw the same thing, but in a much more egregious scale in Purdue Pharma. Uh, there, the company was faced with a bunch of opioid liability and they declared bankruptcy in response to that mounting liability. The settlement plan they came up with in bankruptcy said that the company's owners, the Sackler family, they put in $4 billion into Purdue and the money that's available to claimants in exchange, they would be free from liability from any future lawsuits related to the opioid crisis, including like fraud, intentional torts. Um, and the real kicker here is that the Sacklers knew that this was coming. So they pulled like almost $10, $11 billion in money out of the corporation in the years leading up to the bankruptcy and then threw $4 billion back in for civil immunity. Um, so that's sort of a more egregious example of that release of, of, of claims against people who haven't even declared liability. The final uh, headline, which is really uh, timely, the hearing is happening this week. Um, or I should say that the Purdue Farm bankruptcy settlement has gotten rejected by the court, but it's now in front of um, the Second Circuit. Uh, the next example is Johnson & Johnson, and that company is facing potentially billions upon billions of dollars in liability from talc products that are causing, uh, allegedly causing cancer. And they've done this thing that folks are calling the, the Texas two-step. And it's two steps. Step one, you head over to Texas and you use a quirk in Texas corporate law. It's called a divisive merger. It lets you split your company into two. You put the vast majority of your assets into one company and you put all your talc liability into the other one. Step two. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. Okay, please <laughs> yep. keep going. It's, yeah, keep going. <laughs> Step two, uh, that new company that just got all that telc liability doesn't have a ton of assets. They declare bankruptcy. Um, they also just go randomly to North Carolina to do it because they like Fourth Circuit law on it. Um, and this tactic is designed to shield Johnson Johnson, in my view, Johnson Johnson's assets so they can kind of go about business as usual while cancer victims are stuck in bankruptcy limbo. Um, and there's currently a motion to dismiss the bankruptcy case in uh, District of New Jersey saying that it was not filed in good faith. So um, that debate is ongoing. Sergio, what, what's going on here? This sounds very bad. <laughs> it, 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 well, it can be. Uh, I, I try to be agnostic about it because uh, uh, procedures are sort of like tools. And sometimes tools can be used and sometimes tools can be misused. And it appears that it's being misused here. But um, to, order, to provide like a little bit more uh, background on this, um, I have a lot of international students who are often amazed at how much litigation happens in the first place in the United States. And one of the things I tried to explain to them that in the United States, we use a lot of regulation for regulatory purposes. The idea being that if companies engage in unlawful conduct. Let's say, to use the, the examples that, that Ellen talked about, you know, uh, misrepresent the addictive qualities of opioid drugs or, um, you know, covered up a physician who was sexually abusing gymnasts. Uh, the idea is if, they, if you were able to sue them even in civil court and the victims were able to recover for their losses, this would deter not only that company, but other companies from engaging in, in that conduct in the first place. Uh, this is known as ex post uh, regulatory uh, enforcement mechanisms, um, but it's it's very popular in the United States, and it, and it does it, and um, it actually does a pretty good job when it works. But in order for it to work, companies have to be held accountable. And I think the one headline that you see here, and I think, and, and the intuition people have with a lot of these bankruptcies, is that it appears that the corporate defendants are using the bankruptcy system to either escape or greatly reduce the amount of uh, damages to what they usually pay out to victims, the damages that they would have to pay out. Um, and this could have really seriously detrimental effects in terms of enforcement of the law in the United States. So that's the one big thing that uh, people should really be worried about. 
uh, something like, for example, the Texas two-step, where it appears that essentially Johnson & Johnson is literally sort of partitioning off its liability with respect to talcum powder in order to continue going as a viable company. It's especially offensive given that the bankruptcy system is designed for situations where companies are not going concerns and they need a fresh start. Um, so on top of the, this being disruptive to um, the enforcement mechanisms that we use in the United States, we, on top of that, we have what appears to be a serious abuse of the bankruptcy system. Bankruptcy is for non-going concerns. It's not to be used simply because you find this particular type of liability um, you know, uh, inconvenient. Uh, so having said all that, why am I agnostic about the use of, a, of bankruptcy in order to deal with these types of situations? So my expertise is more in litigation rather than in bankruptcy. In, and litigation has a number of advantages. It is an investigatory tool. You learn a lot of information. The public benefits not only from the proliferation of the scientific uh, information through the evidentiary process, but you also have uh, the development of the law, um, So, which is great. And bankruptcy is not really designed to do that. But the problem with the litigation process is that it takes forever. It takes years in order for a lot of these major cases to unwind. And these are mega cases. We're talking about in the case of US gymnastics, in the case of Purdue Pharma, Johnson Johnson, hundreds, thousands, or sometimes millions of victims, all of which have individual claims. claims. So even though some of the issues may be similar because they're all dealing with the same defendant, at the end of the day, as Ellen pointed out, there's gonna have to, there's, there has to be proceedings whereby they have to show that this particular thing happened to me. I had these injuries, which are gonna be different from victim to victim. And that can take a year long process. I mean, to use an extreme example, the uh, multi-district litigation for asbestos litigation, which was set up in the 19, uh, or actually the early 2000s, is still ongoing. Even though there has been literally decades and decades of asbestos litigation, we all know asbestos is harmful, but it, that's just how long it takes. So what bankruptcy could do is, uh, could actually really decrease the amount of time uh, that we process these types of claims. Now, will we be less accurate? Would it be less precision in the process? Probably, but at the same time, there is some benefits to really getting money into the hands of the victims quickly. Rather than waiting years, maybe you can get it actually within a couple of months. Bankruptcy moves very, very quickly. And on top of that, um, on top of the advantages of, of the, uh, the reduced uh, time, there's also the reduction in costs. Lit litigation is very expensive. Lit attorneys are very expensive. Um, the cost of uh, deposing people, getting experts, doing legal research can really eat sometimes up to 50% of the total recovery. Those costs are greatly reduced when you have a much shorter streamlined process in the bankruptcy uh, context. So bankruptcy might not be all bad. What, what you have to do is you have to set up a, a process by which defendants don't reduce their liability, don't get away with their unlawful conduct, and still, we, but at the same time, reap the more streamlined advantages that bankruptcy can offer. We have a couple of questions just... coming in. Yeah, please, Anna, were you, some of the questions coming in from the audience were asking for some background there, and I was wondering if we could provide a bit more. So are we, are we talking about litigation that's already been complete? and a judgment that is being discharged in bankruptcy? Or are we using the bankruptcy court to deal more with a settlement and a type of remedy? So, uh, Ellen, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's part of the problem here. And when, when our framework is, um, you know, which should we pick, bankruptcy or mass, or, or an MDL, you know, mass towards litigation? To me, as soon as we're asking that question, something has gone very wrong. Uh, because bankruptcy shouldn't be just like, an option as an alternative to the civil justice system. Uh, it doesn't have the same protections whatsoever that the civil justice system has. Uh, it's designed for these circumstances in which we've got a pool of money, but we've got way more claims. And so we don't want everyone to just like go for the pool of money. That's not a fair, equitable distribution um, through litigation. But I get really scared when we start talking about bankruptcy as a way to just resolve these mass torts uh, litigation uh, because it's it's outside of that uh, of that structure the court system that provides that individual due process right I mean 
it, it's true we can get like a group of smart people together, do some social engineering, come up with a really efficient solution. You know, maybe we think it's good, um, but I think doing that is often in tension with people's individual constitutional rights to, if they at the end of the day want to be heard in front of a, ju tri a jury trial, uh, they should get to do that. Um, they have constitutional rights to due process. Uh, Supreme Court has recognized that your right to access the courts is actually part of your First Amendment right to petition the government. Um, so to me, you know, talking about it as this alternative path, but I think that is exactly what's happening to answer the question. Uh, I think it is becoming just like an alternative strategy to litigation, and that's that's concerning to me. Right, and to be the more specifically answer to the question being asked, as we're talking about claims that have not been adjudicated yet, so they haven't been resolved in the judgment, and in some cases, we're um, because bankruptcy has jurisdiction over the entirety of the liability against the debtor. We're talking about claims that have never even been filed, claims that just haven't people haven't even thought about because the victims haven't suffered injuries yet. Um, that's how um, all encompassing the bankruptcy process can be. And I hear Ellen when she talks about this concern that. What's going to end up in the bankruptcy process is you're get, you're not allowing people to have their due process type rights in terms of their day in court, in terms of presenting their evidence, in terms of actually having their case being decided by a judge. Um, I don't think it actually raises as many due process problems because we have had similar procedures whereby we you know uh, kind of the, these these type of aggregate proceedings. Um, where you can have something a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more aggregate or collective in nature. Um, and they do have some benefits. Um, I would personally propose that there's, there, there has to be a way in which we can have the benefits of litigation and the benefits of bankruptcy at the same time. Um, because we do, I will agree with Helen on this, there is a big loss in not actually litigating these cases. Yeah, I mean, I think there is this just this tension there. I want to say as background, because I think it's important that one of the primary features of bankruptcy is that it halts litigation. So like in Johnson and Johnson, when they filed for bank, sorry, Johnson Johnson didn't file for bankruptcy. When this dummy corporation filed for bankruptcy, OPL all means. litigation <laughs> against Johnson Johnson, who's not the debtor, came to a halt. Tens of thousands of cases just stopped. Even people who already had judgments, but they weren't like secured by a bond yet, can't get the money. Um, so all these people's like attempt to have their be heard in court by a jury just halts, and we don't know for how long. Um, I mean, the, the efficiency argument, um, I think it also really depends on it not being abused. Uh, you know, we had another company try something like this Texas two-step, uh, Georgia Pacific, and Best Wall is their kind of version of the dummy corporation. That was in 2017, and all those asbestos claims are still just floating around in bankruptcy. Um, I think another thing that's important is that some of the features of bankruptcy that make things more efficient are the same features that are actually threats to access to justice. So for example, sometimes there's a bar date, like a deadline to file a proof of claim in bankruptcy to order to be the sort of part of the process and get your money at the end of the day. Uh, they can set those bar dates way shorter than the statutory uh, statute of limitations provided by statutes. And so, you know, these these rules are made for companies between sophisticated entities. They make sense, right? Like Bank of America, they can they can meet that deadline. Um, but we're talking about victims of mass torts. They might be in financial ruin. They might have just gotten a cancer diagnosis. They might be homeless because their house just burned down, and they have eight months to file this proof of claim. And so some of the same features that make it more efficient are also the features that actually um, make it beneficial to, for large corporations uh, and deny people access to the courts. We have a question from uh, William Lafferty, a bankruptcy judge here in Oakland. Um, and and he's, he's, he's concerned that this might be exactly why we have Chapter 11 reorganization. And, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that. Is this a problem with bankruptcy and Chapter 11 itself? Or is this uh, 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 something else? Well, I can't really speak to the purposes of Chapter 11. I'm not. I'm, I'm more of a civil procedure, um, complex litigation expert rather than a bankruptcy expert. But I think everyone there, there is a large consensus that the goal of a of bankruptcy is for uh, companies that are can't can't continue as going concerns to have a fresh start. And so we're talking about ideally Chapter 11, which is not to liquidate the assets of the of the companies, but rather to allow them to reorganize so that they can 
keep going. Chapter 11 is actually very useful for certain types of essential uh, type services in industries like airline industries. Like you need planes. You can't liquidate American Airlines um, because that would be disruptive to the American economy. So we have Chapter 11 so that we can restructure American Airlines so that they can continue to service flights. And, 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 every, and it's a big win for everyone. But uh, um, regard, regardless of the, you know, sort of the, the differences you might have with respect to uh, the purposes of bankruptcy, everyone agrees that it re it's really for distressed companies who need a fresh start. Is Johnson & Johnson a distressed company that needs a fresh start? No. I, and I think that's why people are really upset about this Texas two-step. It appears that with Johnson & Johnson, it, it, it doesn't need help to continue as a company with their uh, talcum powder uh, liabilities. They're just using the bankruptcy process to get rid of their talcum powder uh, liabilities. Um, so there has to be something, I, there, I would be in favor of some type of procedure that really gets back to sort of that basic bankruptcy concern with making sure that the, these the chapter 11 and these types of procedures are limited to companies in distress that really need them. Johnson Johnson does not need this. Well, that's the point that the judge is making too, right? That we're talking about very real, but very different problems. And even within the, the three examples that we started out with, you have just US Gymnastics, Purdue, uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, different things are going on here. Or American Airlines, the example you brought up about how we can use the bankruptcy system. So if there, if there are these different issues, how can we change things? What type of changes should we be looking to make so that we can uh, use the system appropriately, say for American Airlines, but perhaps Johnson & Johnson splitting off their talc uh, uh, liability is something that we don't think the bankruptcy system should be uh, uh, advancing. Yeah, I think one thing um, that's easy to target uh, in those examples are releases of non-debtor third-party claims. Uh, and to me, this is really where the due process violations happen. There's a circuit split on this issue. So it's an area where um, legislation could clarify the law. Uh, the, the bankruptcy code actually says no, but there's another provision that gives the bankruptcy courts all this equitable power to help restructuring. So they use that provision that says, oh, you kind of got an equitable power to like make things good um, to overcome what looks to me like a prohibition on um, releasing claims against third parties. But the, the real due process concern here is that you're gonna, you're you're bound if you're in this bankruptcy, even if you don't vote for it. So uh, you might say, no, I don't want to give up my claims. But if you're losing the vote, especially if it's, you know, a lot of people are supporting the bankruptcy plan, then your claim has just been taken away from you, uh, even though you didn't say, okay. I mean, the only context where we start to see things like that are in the class action context where we have tons of procedural protections about you know, making sure you can opt out, making sure you can challenge a, a settlement. Um, and none of that exists in bankruptcy court. It's kind of this like odd ad hoc world where we're just releasing these claims against folks, um, against people's consent. And so to me, that's a real reform point, um, trying to target non-debtor third-party releases. And that release, another question uh, from the audience, that release applies to international uh, uh, clients or victims as well. Would that be correct? This bankruptcy is international, the, the, what is discharged the claims? I think it would depend on the settlement plan um, itself. I would have to like, I think the, the text would be different for each. Um, so like, I know that in the Sacklers one, it was super broad language. It was like, we can't be sued for anything ever in the future. Um, so in that case, it, it might be true. Um, but yeah, I mean, they can, that some courts, they, their compromise is sort of to make it more narrowly tailored and specific and say like, everyone needs to agree, um, you know, that this, that we're, we're okay with releasing these claims. But the real concern here is what that effectively does is it lets big companies buy bankruptcy discharges without any of the burdens of declaring bankruptcy. Um, you can just show up and say, hey, I'll add like $2 million to this pot as long as no one can sue me ever again. Um, and, you know, people are in need for money, bad things happened. And so there's this pressure to say yes. Uh, and that's just not how the civil justice system should work. You shouldn't be able to just buy your way out of, of causing mass death throughout the country. Right. And I, so um, okay. Please go ahead, Sergio. You no, know, and actually uh, I'm on the same page with Ellen with respect to that. I do find that these third party releases where the non, uh, the non corporate defendants the non debtors are able to get these releases from their liability, even though they 
They, they, avoid, they even avoid the burdens of the privacy process altogether. That's a huge problem. And it does appear like you're buying your way out of your liability, like very cheaply as, uh, on that point. And, I, and I'm also uh, in favor of sort of broader or attempts to really make sure that the bankruptcy process is limited to what the bankruptcy process is intended to do, which is to help with distress companies. And so something like uh, some restrictions on the use of divisive merger in order to, to offload of liabilities, there really has to be some restrictions on that. But um, what I would add to that is um, I, I, I would like to see if there's a way that we could balance um, some of the benefits of, the, of litigation with the streamlined processes of bankruptcy. Um, I, I, am in, I am supportive of access to justice. I'm supportive of people's due process rights. But at the end of the day, the victims, I think, just simply want to be made whole. Um, and uh, if, there, if we can have a process by which we can make sure that the, like the, the funds that are created in these settlement trusts and bankruptcy are able to give everybody the relief that, they, that they're entitled to, I think everyone would be okay with that. So uh, I, I would propose, I'm working on a paper where um, we have more coordination between bankruptcy courts and district courts. For example, lifting, whenever something goes into bankruptcy, it stops all any legal proceedings with respect to the assets of the debtor. And this is known as the bankruptcy stay. Um, I, I would propose sort of lifting the stay for certain types of claims and just have them litigated in regular court. This would have the advantage of giving some of the victims your actual due process rights, access to court rights, but also give information to the court in order to better estimate the values of all the claims. Um, that sort of coordination would result in lower costs, more streamlined procedures, and people actually getting, getting the full recovery that they're entitled to. I'm curious because, you know, when I, that sounds a lot like what the MDL process does in some ways, right? You have a centralized process for determining like pretrial motions and discovery, and then you have some bellwether trials. Um, so we can see where like, what are these claims really cost? And then that can facilitate global settlements. It seems like a lot of the distinction when we go into the bankruptcy world, all of a sudden though, you don't have a choice as to whether you settle. And it seems to be that's the main thing that it's taking away when a lot of these efficiency mechanisms, it seems like we can, why can't we achieve them through the MDL process? It's, it's really tough because um, the one, one advantage that you have with bankruptcy that you don't have in the MDL process is that the bankruptcy court has jurisdiction over everything. The MDL process is limited in its jurisdiction to pretrial proceedings to federally filed claims. So what you often see in the MDL process is attempts and sometimes some difficulties and coordinating MDL proceedings in federal court with, for example, litigation in state courts. Some states might have their own sort of localized MDL processes. They have their own judges. And a lot of this division can create some collective action problems and making sure that uh, everyone sort of is on the same page with providing relief uh, for the victims. Bankruptcy, and, and that's sort of one of the interesting things about bankruptcy. Um, remember, I, I started this by saying that, you know, procedures are tools. Um, and sometimes uh, the tool can be used or misused. I often think about my, my father was a mechanic and every once in a while he would need to, for example, hammer something while working on a car. We didn't have a hammer, he used a wrench. And I'm like, that's not a hammer, that's a wrench. But my dad said, it does the job at the moment. A lot, of, a lot of American law really works this way. Is this what the bankruptcy system was intended to do? Probably not. Um, do we wanna make sure that it's not abused? Absolutely. But it's there, it's the wrench, and we need to deal with these problems. Maybe it could work. And that's all I want to suggest here. Should, uh, uh, with respect to that, that final point, should the bankruptcy courts, though, be the ones deciding, and this was a question the judge was asking, about whether or not it's being used in good faith, whether or not the wrench is being used uh, for some sort of benefit of the mechanic rather yeah. than the hammer? And is that something that the bankruptcy court should be deciding on a case by case basis, or perhaps should we take that out and, and put it in the hands of someone else to, to address this? I mean, I think it would be great to have legislation that creates a more concrete, clear, applicable standard. I mean, the standard is really judge made right now, the good faith, it's not even in the bankruptcy code, I don't think. Um, so uh, I think that would be great. But until that happens, judges do have to step up and do it because otherwise nobody else will. Um, and it is become well-established law. 
Um, and you know, once things get going in the bankruptcy system, hard to unwind. So, uh, I think they really do have the responsibility, uh, given how a law is written right now to be those gatekeepers, um, and say, you know, in your gut, is this, a sh you know, a sham, um, are we trying to evade liability? And that's, that's so important for deterrence too, because we talk a lot about trying to get money into victims' hands right away, but lots of times there's, there's lots of money somewhere back there. Um, to kind of put into a pot and get into victims' hands, but that means that if they don't, if the company doesn't take a hit, they're not going to be deterred from doing it again. If the Sackler family can just throw in four billion and walk away, there's no deterrence factor. Um, so there's no protection, and it just becomes a system of like, you know, you can pay it out whenever you accidentally kill a hundred thousand people. Um, and so I mean, exaggeration, but I, I think that's um, that's the concern. No, but it's a huge concern. I, You're not exaggerating. It's a huge concern. This is a huge concern, and I, I can't thank you guys enough for, for joining us for this conversation. We could have, and in fact, there are uh, uh, programs coming up on this issue. Uh, uh, it's posted here in, uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, uh, thank you to the executive director of the CGRI, Ann Bloom. Thank you to the Berkeley Executive uh, Education and everyone else who made today's conversation possible. I also want to remind everyone that we will be having more conversations in civil justice each month this spring. Our next conversation will be on March 18th with our guest, John Manley, the lead lawyer in the recently settled UCLA sex abuse litigation. So please join us for that. Thank you again, Ellen, Sergio. Just a fantastic uh, uh, talk this morning. No, Thanks uh, so much. Thank you for having us.